Hmm. Hi guys, happy... I don't even know what day it is. Happy Saturday? Yeah. Happy Saturday. <laughs> so. Uh, oh my god. It, it, there's so much going on, it's crazy. Um, okay, so how are we doing with Ouija Are we... I know we're doing good. I know you guys are doing good. Sean, I'm glad that we uh, got to talk. So we can uh, know where we are at. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, you guys are doing awesome, so just keep doing what you're doing. It is incredible. You guys are amazing. So, uh, this boot camp is going to go on for a little bit longer, a lot longer, than regular normal because of circumstances with uh, the dog. So, um, every penny I have had had just to go to, you know, um, my dog. So, but, all right. I wanted to talk today about okay the the magical chain, r linking yourself to magical chains, and this is where we uh, it actually comes in and plays into the Ouija too, into spiritism, um, into mediumship, into every single either uh, Ouija working or magical working that we do, ritual working, anything. It's, it's amazing. The uh, the pentagram. The pentagram has it's the key that's all i'm going to say is the key the pentagram is the key to everything to life to everything along with the major arcana of tarot so literally tarot is a book so we read it like a book but first before we go into that i wanted to just again talk to you guys about that magical chain so it's pretty cool. And late at night, though, it's it's easier for me. I wish I could do this at like night, uh, like live. It'd be better, um, but I can't for obvious certain reasons. <laughs> so okay, the tr triple chain. What do you guys think a chain would be? What what would? Why would we need a chain in magic? A triple chain, and why is that important? Important, and triple three. Alright, so, alright, the great work in practical magic, after the education of the will, and the personal creation of the mage. So, what we do when we go into ceremonial magic, any kind of magic, any kind of working, we are creating ourselves, reinventing ourselves within a magical context and a spiritual context. So, um, so this is the formation of the magnetic chain. And this secret is truly that of priesthood and royalty. Alright, so, when we learn to master uh, the four elements, when we learn to uh, master ourselves, our minds, we link, we make, we create chains. So those can be like etheric cords that connect us to a different uh, source, a different deity, um, an ancestor. So. When you guys actually get on the board and you are talking to your ancestors or they're your chosen deity um you're literally the more you think okay so you think you're thinking about this deity so uh baphomet or sophia or venus venus obviously you are sending out a ripple so literally through the third eye through the eyes from the heart through the top of the head the crown chakra uh, and depending where else your body heats up when you think of these deities. So you can think of one deity. Uh, if I think of my grandma, I think my whole body feels warm and, and good. So that is a literal magnetized chain that is between us, me and her. So like, for instance, uh, when me and uh, at night I channel for people, um, it just rolls. Uh, Liam, you know. <laughs> Um, that chain, that's that link. So when you just flow, it just flows so nicely and so easily. That is the chain. So, so yes, it is the formation of the magnetic chain. And this sacred is truly that of the priesthood and royalty. So, how do you form a magnetic chain? Alright, to form a magnetic chain is to give birth to a current of ideas 
that produces faith and that leads a great number of wills into a given circle of manifestation through acts. A well-formed chain is like a whirlpool which pulls in and absorbs everything. So, be careful. Be careful how you make your chains and who you, you make your chains with people. So, um, a chain can be established in three ways. There's three ways to create this chain. So, um, it, just listen. <laughs> by signs, by words, and by personal contact. So, by words, by signs, and personal contact. So, me and the board. There's a chain there. Uh, me and whatever I, you know, my, my, divinatory, my divinatory tools. There's a chain there. Me and my grandma. There's a chain there. So, it's the constant thought. It's a constant thought of being linked to that person, object, deity. So, um, it, yes, it is, um, a uh, chain is established through the signs by having a sign adopted by public opinion as the representation of a force. Alright, so, obviously the devil uh, is universal. That's a chain. A very bad chain. A ridiculous chain. So, so it is thus that all the Christians communicate together by the sign of the cross. So again, we have the cross for Christianity, which is really not Christian. It's a uh, Osiris, or it's actually a uh, who is it? Osiris the slain? Is I, I'm thinking right? Maybe. Um, so uh, the pentagram that is what uh, connects us together. Certain symbols, uh, logos. That's amazing. So the sign of the cross. Uh, the you know, signals to the Christians that, you know, they see their church, they see their cross, boom, their magical chain has been formed. Alright, so, uh, the Masons, by the sign of the set square under the sun, the mage, the mages, by the sign of the microcosmos, which is made by extending the five fingers, and so on. Yeah, literally, like that. That means nothing means nothing. What it does mean is Horus, or Set, any of the Egyptian horned gods, deities. Doesn't mean anything. Well, that means something in Hawaiian, but it doesn't mean Hail Satan or anything like that. So, all right, the signs, one received and propagated, acquire power on their own. So, um, over time, you will adapt your own personal signs. So, and then that re that just builds up. So it's like a spiritual build up of very good energy. Very good energy. If you want it to be. Um, where'd I go? I, I don't know where I went, guys. Okay, the sight and the imag- oh. An imitation of the sign of the cross uh, sufficed in the first few centuries to create proselytes for Christianity. So the so-called uh, miraculous metal still causes a great many conversation in our time by the same magnetic law. So if two people are together, or if you like, say for instance, um, a few years ago, I met a really good uh, friend, uh, and she noticed my pentagram, and she greeted me, uh, Mary Neat, and blessings, blessed be when she left. That was, that's the way, the greeting, that is, you know, it's amazing. So she recognized that within me through this little star. Actually, I think it was my tattoos, I'm not sure, but it was pretty cool. Alright, so, uh, the so-called miraculous metal, yes, okay, we already went over that, so, okay, the vision, illumination of the young Israelite, Alphonse de Resbon, were the most remarkable instances of this kind. Imagination is creative, not only within us, but outside of us. Alright, so, the universe is completely mental, it's the all 
which is a god goddess or spirit, whatever you want to call it, is mental. It's a thought. So, it's a giant brain. Literally. So, um, okay, outside of us and through our fluidic projections, and that is literally our thoughts. So, thought means it's fluid, it's fluidity. It flows. So, um, yes, through our flu fluidic projections, and we should doubtless, doubtless not, some of these words, uh, tribute to other causes of the phenomena of, Con of Constantine's liberum. So, and the cross of Mignet. So, the magical chain, through the word, is represented by the ancients, by those chains of gold, which come out of the mouth of Thoth, or Hermes, the thrice great born. So, where'd I go? So yes, out of the mouth of Hermes. Nothing is equal to the electrifying effect of eloquence. Yeah, just, yeah, soak this in. So, the word creates the highest intelligence in the heart of the most crudely composed masses. So, basically what you see on TV. Uh, logos, sigils, sigil magic. That can trigger and affect thousands. Like the National Anthem, for instance. When we put our hands on our hearts for the National Anthem or the flag or whatever. I haven't done that in a long time, so I don't know. That is instant trigger that affects literally the entire United States. And that's a lot of people. So, you guys kind of can see where that goes from. It's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. So, but yes, that cur uh, it crudely composes masses. Composed masses. So, even though, so even those who are too far to hear, uh, to hear, understand by the commotion, caused by those words, are drawn in like the rest of the crowd. So, Peter the Hermit shocked all of Europe by crying out, God wills it. That's the word. That's the verb. That's the verb right there of creation. So, a single word from the Emperor electrified his army and rendered France invincible. So, uh, Proud Han killed socialism with his famous paradox, property is theft. See these logos and slogans? Amazing. A single word which, has, which takes flight often suffices to overturn a power. So that's where we get, we kill them with kindness, we temper hatred with love. It was very amazing. Voltaire knew this well, and he turned the word upside down with his sarcasms. He, who feared neither popes nor kings, nor the parliament, nor prison, was afraid of play on words. So, alright, this is still fuzzy. There we go. So, you see? That's it, it pretty amazing. Okay. Um... So yes, uh, we are on the cusp right now of accomplishing the will of any man whose words we repeat. Thus, the translations of these books, these grimoires, that is why they are so important. So, the third manner of establishing a magical, magical chain is through contact between persons who see each other often. Uh, the head of the current is soon revealed, um, and the stronger will does not take long to absorb the others. So, direct and positive contact of hand-to-hand -hand completes the harmony of dispositions, and it is for this reason that, uh, that it is a mark of sympathy and intimacy. So, when we shake hands with somebody, we're connecting, we're connecting when we hug, we're building a chain of love. So, 
uh, ch uh, children who are instinctively guided by nature. Very true. All kids, all kids can see. They can see things unless they're raised not to. So, um, guided by nature, create a magical chain when they play British Bulldog or Ring Around the Rosie. So, the gaiety circulates and the laughter blossoms. Round tables are the most favorable to joyous banquets than any other form. So, a whole, the roundness, inclusive, all-inclusiveness. There we go. Lots of secrets here. So, alright. Um, the young round dance of the Sabbath. Uh, which came at the end of the mysterious reunions of the adepts of the Middle Ages. It was a magical chain which united everyone in the same desires and the same works. They formed it by placing themselves with their backs facing the, uh, the others, holding each other's hand, their fingers interlacing, and uh, facing out of the circle in imitation of the ancient sacred dances, whose images we still find on uh, bas reliefs of ancient temples. How cool. How cool. So, um, the electric furs of the lynx, the panther, and even the domestic cat were in imitation of the ancient bacanila, bach, bachanila, I don't know how to say that word, attached to their clothing. From there came the tradition that Miss Grants, Miss Crean, Miss, Miss Creance at the Sabbath each carrying a cat hanging from their belt and dance, which is attached to them. Metaphor. That's a metaphor. So, alright, now here comes talking tables and turning tables, which might throw some people off. Just don't let it. The phenomena of turning and talking tables. So, 403. Let's see. Levi refers again to spiritualism, uh, which was all the rage in Paris when he wrote this. It's, it's pretty cool. So, okay, the phenomena of turning and talking tables is an acted accidental manifestation of fluidic communication through a circular chain, and then mystification got mixed into it, and even educated intelligent people became impassionate, impassioned by this novelty to the point of mystifying themselves and becoming dupes of their own infatuation. So that is where you need to watch how much work you do with the board. Um, balance it out. Just pretty much a balance. So, the oracles at the tables were just suggested answers more or less uh, voluntarily or randomly chosen. So, they resemble the discourse one has or uh, hears in dreams. So, other even stranger phenomena could be the externalized product of products of common imagination. So, a collective group of people can totally make a table, a tip up, tipping tables, collective group, people. Uh, my dad has a story of a table, they didn't even know the entire table rose, and then all of a sudden it went boom. So he experienced that, uh, and a lot of other people did too, it was pretty, pretty neat from what I hear. So yes, it is the accidental manifestation of fluids, fluidic communication through a circular chain. So, um, we do not deny without doubt the possible, the possible intervention of the elementary spirits in these manifestations, as in divination by cards or by dreams. But we in no way believe that it is proven, and therefore nothing obliges us to admit otherwise. So, yeah, a lot of, uh, we've come a long way since uh, the 1700s. A long way. So. Uh, the strangest power of the human imagination is the realization of desires of the will, or even in apprehensions and fears. So, realization. It's crazy. So, we easily believe in what we fear or we, what we desire, says the proverb. And it is correct, because desire and fear provide the imagination with creative power whose effects are incalculable. How is it, for example, that we are so often infected by illness, the illness that we fear? So we fear an illness, and we get that illness. Where'd I go? 
So we have already uh, recounted Paracelsus' opinions on this subject, and we have, you know, established in our doctrine the occult laws as observed, observed through experience, but through magnetic currents, and through the intercession of the chain, these realizations are even stranger still, since they almost always unexpected when the chain is not formed by an intelligent, sympathetic, and stronger leader. So, they result in fact from purely random and fortious combinations, vulgar fears of superstition. Now this is, this is what is good here. Vulgar fears of superstition. Dinner guests, when they find themselves 13 at a table, combined with the conviction that a misfortune men's menaces the youngest and the weakest among them, like most superstitions, a relic of the magical science. So, superstitions. What is that? Uh, the duonary being a complete and cyclical number in the universal analogies of nature, always pulls in and absorbs the thirteenth, a number regarded as unlucky and super Fluous? Superfluous. So, if the circle of a windmill's grindstone is represented by the number 12, the number 13 is the grain it will grind. The ancients established, established base, based on similar cons considerations, the distinction between lucky numbers and unlucky ones, which resulted in the observance of days of bad and good omens. So, it is with this type of material that the imagination is the most creative and numbers and days rarely miss being favorable or ill-fated for those who believe in their influence. So, superstition. <laughs> so it is thus with the reason that Christianity prescribed, prescribed the divinatory sciences uh, because in thus dismissing the number of fatal chances it has provided more resources and control, more control to liberty. All right. So, they fear. Fear. It's all fear. So, printing is an admirable mechanism for forming a magical chain by the extension of the word. So, in effect, not one single book is ever lost. Writing always goes where they must go, and the aspirations of thought attract words. So, when I sit down to write a book, boom, it just flows. It all flows very well, too. So, that is channeling, kind of, in a way. Okay, so we have proven this a hundred times during the course of our initiation into magic. The rarest of books offers always offered themselves to us without searching, without our searching for them, so the moment they become indispensable for us. It is in this manner that we rediscovered um, intact the universal, the universal science that may erudites believed was buried under several successive uh, cataclysms. So, it is thus that we entered into the great magical chain which begins with Hermes or Enoch and will only finish with the word. So, thus uh, we are able to invoke and render represent render presence to the spirits of Apollonius, of Plotinus, of Sinius, or Paracelsus, or Cardano of Cornelius Agrippa and so many others who more or less known but are too religiously famous for us to name lightly. So, uh, we continue with our great work uh, with others. We'll take in, wait, so we continue their great work, us, we do, of these ancient peoples of Paracelsus and all of them which others will take and offer us, take on offer, take on after us. So, but to whom will it be given and completed? Who will complete it? I don't think anybody ever will. All right, so the great work. What is the great work that is behind everything? What we are doing, what we... So, to, be, to always be rich, ever young and never die, um, as such has always been the dream of the alchemists. So, uh, to change lead, mercury, and all other metals into gold, 
to possess the universal medicine and the elixir of life. This is the problem which must be resolved in order to accomplish this wish and realize the dream, this dream. So, it's all metaphorical, you guys already know that. So, like all magical mysteries, the secrets of the great work have triple significance, signification. They are religious, philosophical, and natural. So, take with that, take with this what you want. Uh, the, philosoph the philosophical goal in religion is absolute and supreme reason. In philosophy, it is truth. In visible nature, it is the sun. It in, in the underground, in mineral world, it is the most perfect and pure gold. So, that's, that's the gold. That is what the gold the alchemist represents. So, it is for this reason that we call the search for the great work, the search for the absolute. So, and that we even uh, designate this work by the name of the labor of the sun. So all the masters of the science recognize that it is impossible to arrive at material, material results if we have not found in two upper degrees all the analogies of the universal medicine and of the philosopher's stone. Different, very different. Sounds difficult, doesn't it? Okay, so also, so they say, the, the work is simple, easy, and inexpensive. And I will tell you that yes, it's very, very, very simple. It's quite simple. So you don't have to do much. I mean, you have to do a lot. You have to research and study and dedicate. But it's, it's very uh, easy. So if pursued otherwise, uh, it fruitlessly consumes the fortune of the lives of so-called puffers. So, and puffers is just another, it's like a slang word um, for people that aren't of uh, the great work. People that don't focus on, you know, completing their work. Yes, puffers. The term sulfurous in French was used in the Middle Ages and Renaissance for would-be alchemists who did not possess the secret of the great work. So, that's a puffer. You know, many puffers. Alright, so this is really, really cool right here. The universal medicine for the soul is supreme reason and absolute justice. For the spirit, it is mathematical and practical truth. For the body, it is the quintessence, quintens, quint, quintessence, which is a combination of light and gold. The raw material of the great work in the upper world uh, is enthusiasm and activity. <laughs> so, um, in the intermediate world, it is intelligence and industry. In the lower world, it is labor and it is science. It is sulfur, mercury, and salt which successively mm. vitalized and fixed, vitalized and fixed, compose the Azoth of the Sages. All right, so all the masters of alchemy who prayed about, who wrote about the great work, used symbolic and figurative expressions. And they had to do so, uh, as much to distance the profane from a work which is too dangerous to them to be properly heard by adepts by revealing the entire world of the analogies which rules the unique and sovereign doctrine of Hermes. Okay, um, as far as the doctrine of Hermes or the Emerald Tablets of Hermes or the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, um, I, they are basically both the same work, just from two different perspectives of one, one being Hermes slash Thoth. So, um, so thus for them, gold and silver are the king and queen, or the moon and the sun. Sulfur is the flying eagle. Mercury is the winged and bearded ag andragon, andragon, standing on a cube and crowned in flames. So that would be Baphomet. That would be Baphomet. So that's Mercury. Matter or salt 
is the winged dragon. The metals at boiling point are lions of diverse colors. Finally, the entire work is symbolized by the pelican and the phoenix. <laughs> it's different, isn't it? It's very kind of different, difficult. So, and this is, let's see, anybody that really wants to get into this, what I'm doing right now, get the Kabbalion by the Three Initiates on Amazon. It's very cheap. It's like $3. So is the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. You can get that for like $2.99. So, J.J. Rover, get his version, or the other doctor, Dr. Morel. It is either one of those versions. Get all, get all of them if you can. I mean, don't waste your money. So, the Hermetic art is thus at the same time a religion, a philosophy, and all natural science. All right, so we're getting somewhere. So, as a religion, it belongs to the ancient mages and initiates initiates of all time as the philosophy. We can find its principle in the School of Alexandria and in the theories of Pythagoras as a science, and one must ask Pythagoras, Nicholas, Flamel, and Raymond Lully for the procedures. So, I wonder if we could, whoa, I wonder if we could channel those guys. I think we could. So, I think, I really think we could do that. So, the science is only real to those who admit and understand philosophy and religion. So, and it all produ reproduce produces, oh, and its procedures can be successfully enacted by the adept who has achieved sovereign will and thus become the king of the elementary world. So, uh, ruling the spirits, of all, ruling the four elementals. So. Where'd I go? Okay, okay, so because the great agent of the operation of the sun is that force described by Hermes, symbol of the emerald tablet is a universal magical power. It is the fiery spiritual mover. It is the OD according to the Hebrews, which would be God. They leave out the G. And the astralite according to the expression we have adopted into this work. So making sense. This is the secret fire, living and philosophic, which all the hermetic philosophies only discuss with the most mysterious reverse. It is the universal sperm whose secret they have kept, and which they represent only by the figure of Hermes, Hermes, Hermes's Caduceus. So, Caduceus very important very important so here then is the great hermetic arcanum and we reveal it here clearly and without mystical figures for the first time what the adepts call dead matter consists of bodies as they found are found in nature living bodies are substances which are assimilated and magnetized by the science and the will of the operator Hmm. Makes sense. You, you guys will get this. So, uh, in this manner, the great work is something more than a chemical operation. Um, it is a veritable creation of the initiated human verb to the power of the verb of God itself. God itself. Not himself or herself. God itself. Alright, so, let's see. The Hebrew text, which uh, we transcribed here, as proof of the authenticity and reality of our discovery. So, is by the Jewish rabbi Abraham, uh, Nicholas Flamel's master, and found in the occult commentary for Sefer Yetzirah, the sacred book of the Kabbalah, which is very hard to find, by the way. This uh, commentary is very rare, but sympathetic powers from our chain allowed us to find an example, which was conserved until 
1643. So that secret has been kept that long. Well, yeah, until this came out, so. Okay. In the library of the Protestant Church of Rome, when we read, or well, we read there, written on the first page, ex dono, then an in ineligible name, then de magni. The creation of gold in the great work is done through transmutation and by multiplication. Pretty interesting, hey? I think so. So, where'd I go? Alright. Hmm. Alright, Raymond Lully says that to make gold, one must have gold and mercury. So, that to make silver, one must have silver and mercury. Then he adds, by mercury I mean the mineral spirit so fine and so pure that it even glids the seed of gold and silvers the seed of silver. So there is no doubt that he speaks here of the OD or astral light. So God, goddess, spirit, source, whatever. Salt and sulfur are only used in the work for the preparation of mercury, and it is above all to mercury, which one um, assimilate and in a manner incorporates the magnetic agent. So, understanding magical chains and the great work. So, uh, Akunrath represents and summarizes the most knowledgeable Gnostic schools and associates himself with the mysticism of Synesius. He affects being Christian and in his expressions and his signs, but it's, it is easy to recognize that his Christ is that of Abraxas. Uh, the illuminous shining pentagram on the astronomical cross. The incarnation in humanity of the Sun King celebrated by Emperor Julian. It is the luminous and living manifestation of that uh, Rosh Elohim that, according to Moses, covered and worked the surface of the waters at the birth of the world. So, it is the man's son. It is the king of light. It is the supreme mage master and vanquisher of the serpent. So, and Kunrath finds in the quadruple legend of the Gospels the allegorical key to the great work. So, in one of the pentacles of his magical book, he represents the philosopher's stone standing in the middle of a fortress surrounded by a wall with 20 doors that lead nowhere. On one way, one way he alone leads to the sanctuary of the great work. So, do you guys remember when a long time ago I was talking about how my, my, the methodology behind my creative process, I always see these doors. It's all linking up to everything that I am reading. It's, it's weird. It's, it's cool, but it's weird. So, <clears throat> above the stone, wait. Yes, okay, above the stone is the triangle on a winged dragon, and on the stone is engraved the name of Christ, which he qualifies as the symbolic image of all nature. It is through him alone, he adds, that you are able to reach the universal medicine for man, for animals, for plants, and for minerals. So the winged dragon, dominated by the triangle, represents the Christ of Kunrath, and that is to say, the sovereign intelligence of light and life. It is the secret of the pentagram. It is the highest doctrin doctrinal and practical mystery of traditional magic. From there to the great and ever incommunicable, Arkham is but one more step. This gets even better. Even better. The, the Kabbalistic figures of Abraham and the Jew who provided Flamel with the beginning of the science are nothing more than the 22 keys of the tarot. 
imitated and summarized elsewhere in the Twelve Keys of Bess Lewis, Valentinas. The sun and the moon appear there under the figure of the emperor and the empress. Mercury is the magus. The grand hierophant is the adept or the abstractor of quintessence. Death, judgment, love, the dragon or the devil. The hermit or the lame old man. Finally, all the other symbols which are found with their principal attributes and almost in the same order. It could be not otherwise. So, since the tarot is the prim primordial book and the keystone of the occult sciences, it must be as hermetic as, as it is Kabbalist Kabbalistic. So, tarot. Magical and theosophical. We also find in the reunion of Valentinius's 12th and 22nd key, one superimposed on the other, the hieroglyphic revelation of our solution to the mystery of the great work. It gets good. It gets even better, guys. So, uh, the 12th key of the tower represents a man suspended by a foot, which is the hangman, to a giblet composed of tree three trees, or sticks, forming the figures of the Hebrew letter, which is like an N, the man's or arms, 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 from a triangle, with his head, and his entire hieroglyphic form is an upside-down triangle mounted on a cross, an alchemical symbol known oops, by the, all the adepts, which represents the accomplishment of the great work. The, 20, the 22nd key, uh, which has the number 21, because the fool, which precedes it in the Kabbalistic order, has no number represents a young divinity who is lightly veiled, running through a flowery crown, supported at the four corners of the four elements, animals, four animals of the Kabbalah. So this divinity holds a wand in each hand in the Italian tarot deck. And in the tarot of Bessequon, she unites both wands in one single hand and places her other hand on her thigh. So both equally uh, remarkable symbols of magnetic action. So, um, al either alternatively by their popular polarization or simultaneously through opposition and transmission. Alright, so here we go. Are you guys ready to hear this? <coughs> the great work of Hermes is thus an essential, essentially a magical operation, and the highest of all because it is because it supposes the absolute in science and in the will. There is light and gold, and there is golden light, and there is light in all things. The intelligent which, oh, the intelligent will which assimilates the light thus directs the operation of the substantial form and only uses chemistry as a wholly secondary instrument. The influence of the will and the human intelligence on the operations of nature, in part, depend on its work. I love this. It's incredibly so real, uh, it is incredibly so real a fact that all serious alchemists who have succeeded because of their knowledge and their faith have reproduced their thought in the phenomena of the fusion, of the salification and other uh, recomposition of metals. Agrippa, a man of immense erosion and beautiful genius, but a pure philosopher and a skeptic, was unable to surpass um, the limits of the analysis and the synth synthesis of metals. Italia, a confused, befuddled, where'd it go? Befuddled and fan fantastical Kabbalist who is nonetheless blessed with perseverance, uh, reproduced in alchemy the anomalies, anomalies of the of his misunderstood and disfigured tarot, the metals in their uh, crucibles. Yes, their metals in their crucible took on singular forms, uh, which excited the curiosity of all of Paris, 
so without any other change in the fortunes of the operator than the fees he demanded by his uh, visitors, um, an obscure alchemist in our time. So, who died mad? The poor uh, Luis Cambriel truly did heal his neighbors and res... That's not resurrected. Resecuted? Resecuted, according to the whole neighborhood, a smith and his friends. For him, the metallic work tool on the most inconvincible forms uh, were most illogical illogical in appearance. He saw one day in his crucible the figure of God, incandescent like the sun, transparent like crystals, and having a body composed of triangular assemblages that Cambriel naively compared to the pile of little piers. So, that is quite a bit. Quite a bit. So that is uh, the great work and the magical chain that we produce. Which is very cool. So, going back to the tarot now. Everything at Hermes or Thoth. Same thing, different, you know, facets of the disco ball. Is everything that we need to know. So. Where did we leave off? So we, we did... Let's see, we did uh, the fool, the magician, and the ha. Uh, the fool. We did the magician. We did the high priestess. So we left off at the empress. So, here is the empress. So, all of everything that we need to know are in this, these 22. 22 cards. So the Empress. She is nature. She is Mother Earth. She is the goddess. She, um... Yeah, I love uh, the Empress. She is very, very motherly. Um, to me, she represents Mother Earth in a slightly different form, a slightly different goddess which, when I get there, alright, so the Empress, so we went from the Fool starting out in his journey, zero, nothingness, form, spirit on the verge of manifestation, to one, the Magician, using our mental um, powers, and, you know, as above, so below, as within, as without, those energies and those powers, to create. So, and then the High Priestess, two choices. We have choices. What, what are we going to do with our knowledge? What are we going to do with uh, just anything? So, choices, finding the hidden. So, that is where we left off. So, in this journey. So, so three. Uh, the number three is magical. It represents, uh, well, I think it represents uh, coming together, I, I'm pretty sure. So, the Empress, um, a mature woman crowned with stars, rich with jewels, rules a fertile land around her neck as a pendant on which is a five-pointed star. The pentagram is the symbol of the five senses, as well as of wealth and the earth. So. It appears in the suit of the pentacles of the Minor Arcana. So, and now the Empress within the Cosmos. This is amazing. The Empress is the Great Mother, the physical form of creation. So, what we perceive with our senses as the Cosmos. So what we see, this represents how we see the individual. That would represent how I see the Cosmos. This would represent how you guys see the Cosmos.
So it is just our senses and how we, in senses and perception of reality, how we view our reality. So she gives from her body as a mother gives milk to her infant. Uh, we dwell on her body. We draw fruit, food from her body. Uh, we admire her beauty, and when we look up at the starry sky, wind, clouds, rain, sunshine are from her. So, that archetypal energy rules over those phenomena. So, uh, we dance and love on her body, but we also defile her body. So, while the mother can seem endlessly nurturing, endlessly forgiving, there's a point at which she, her resources do give out. So, uh, like cancer, exposure to too much sun, natural disasters, windstorms, rainstorms, um, deluges, all of that. So, uh, the Empress card emphasizes the gift of life. So, a bird in the foreground clasps a berry in its beak. The earth feeds her children winged, finned, and legged. The fertility of the earth is illustrated by the globe that floats amidst ripe stalks of grain and wildflowers. The mountains in the background recall the recovered medi or the favored meditation grounds of sages. So, mountains are the earthly there. Alright. Now, the high priestess within the in human community. The empress, or yes, the empress I meant, is, she is the ecosystem of civilization, farmlands, fishing and hunting grounds, mines, timberlands, parks, and gardens, all natural resources used by humans, both the beauty and the perils of cultivation, cultivation, cultivation and husbandry are implicit in the Empress. She is exquisite, she is exquisite gardens, and beloved animal companions, as well as uh, strip mine mountainsides and smoggy skies. So, Liam, you saw a wolf yesterday, an animal companion of the goddess of the Mother Earth. What would that represent to you through analogy, word association? Pretty cool. So, okay, so historically all over the world, nature has been Oh, has been seen as a force to be subjugated, dominated, and exploited. Um, the parallel with the roles of men and women is obvious. For example, the Creator in the Hebrew book of Genesis commanded man to subdue women, woman, the woman, oh, the earth, and dominate its life. So, the ecology movement offers a different point of view. A stewardship role obliges humankind to protect Earth's resources and to use them only if they are able to be preserved and or regenerated. So the concept is workable and probably more realistic at this point in time. So stewardship um, does not relinquish the paternalistic idea of human rulership over nature, but at last, or at least the power exerted is meant to be benevolent rather than greedy, destructive, or negligent. We get a lot of energy and power from our Mother Earth. Now this is where the elements come in. Humankind must arrive at an agreement with nature. We must arrive at an agreement with nature. <clears throat> she is not other nor outside of ourselves. Nature is humanity. In conflict with her, is suicide. Truth. The Empress personifies the vital interdependence of humankind and nature. So, that is the High Priestess, or the Empress. That is her role in the human community. Which is amazing. So, alright. So, the individual. So, this is how we would perceive the Empress within ourselves. Uh, the Empress is our mother, real or idealized. She may literally be a mother, or she may be a motherly person, male or female. She believes in her progeny, 
No matter if the whole world is opposed, she will always be supportive and encouraging, ready to lend a hand. With loyalty that borders on ferocity, she guards her own. So, the Empress can help us grow, or she can stunt us with overprotectiveness, smothering rather than mothering. So, a tendency to be materialistic can make the Empress exploitative. She indicates wealth, especially wealth gained directly from natural resources. Hmm. The Empress loves nature, nature, generally not in rugged majesty, but as made comfortable for human activities. So, gardening, uh, easy hiking trails, parks, horse riding, zoos, fishing, bird watching, crafts using natural object, objects, camping in spring and fall, recreational beaches, and so on. So she is fond of food and loves to cook for others. Her home is the gathering place for family, whose members may be her best friends, as well as her children and relatives. So, the Empress can indicate an unexpected pregnancy or controversially planned pregnancy. So, that is the Empress. So, and that is three. So e and every tarot deck is completely different, but the 22 major cards are still there. That is why I'm only working with these. Now we have the Emperor. Husband. Husband to nature. Husband to Mother Earth. And he is the he represents uh, the sustaining mind. So, his uh, orb and his uh, rod represent um, kind of quelling rebellion. So, he sustains our mind so we can focus and direct our, our will, our energy. Um, very astrolog astrological. The ram's heads. So, the emperor. Very amazing stuff. I mean, just incredible. <clears throat> so, the emperor is enthroned. The symbols of his power before him, the scepter is the rod of chastisement, whereby rebellion is quelled. So the orb signifies the universal extent of the emperor's dominion, which is everything, just like the people, the empress. So, okay. In the background is a lush walled garden. The emperor's love and care flowers the earth. Just beyond the wall are the sands of the desert. The displeasure of the ruler is the waste of war and neglect. So, pyramids, the giant tombs of the pharaohs, rise from the desert. The throne of the emperor is the seat of power. The two ram's head, sir, heads surmount it, symbolizing the astro astrological sign of Aries. Head of the zodiac, the starry night sky edges the chair. So you can see um, night and day, all within that one card. Lots of stuff. So, okay, now within the cosmos, the cosmic meaning of the emperor. So basically, a more spiritual meaning. Okay, now whereas the magician is the creative mind, we create with our mind, project our will. The Emperor is the sustaining mind, husband to nature, the Empress. So he and she are interdependent. They cannot exist without each other. So the Empress is the wind and the phenomena such as hot and cold, uh, wet and dry, that make the wind blow. The Emperor is neither cause nor result. So he is what unites the results and its casual phenomena. The Emperor is natural law. So he represents these seven hermetic principles, or the seven 
laws of nature. So he is natural law. So he is what brings all of our magical workings together. Huh. That was a really short cosmic one. Different. So, now. Um, the emperor within the human community, within our community. So, uh, the empress is the natural infrastructure of society. The emperor is the rules by which resources are used and distributed, the power structure and the status quo. He may symbolize a ruler, elected or self-appointed, a government or the collective will of people, especially in nationalistic terms. So, the emperor's raised eyes indica indicate ambition to improve the conditions of his subjects, to create more equitable system of government, or to exhort more wealth from his subjects and to force his rule on people and lands beyond his proper realm. In essence, the emperor is authority and the determination to mold the world in accordance to the will. So, that is us. That is us molding what we want through the empress, through the forces of nature. See how it tells a story? So you guys can see back from yesterday's video, the, the day before yesterday, with the first three cards, you guys can put the story together. So, the emperor signifies government buildings, such as the United States Capitol and the English House of Parliament, and national monuments and memorials. The urge to build, to govern, to colonize, to incorporate, to act out the philosophies of government are in the emperor's realm. Danger may come in crossing his dynamic, um, imperishable ambition, which is to say, basically, if we don't direct our thoughts for the good of ourselves and all, then it just completely turns around, eats its tail. So what goes around, comes around. Alright, so, okay, the individual. Now this is the emperor representation of you, of us. So, the parent, the dictator, the school teacher, the elected official, are the emperor. Self-discipline and self-imposed rules are also the emperor. So, what we make ourselves do. We force ourselves to get up every morning. Well, some of us have to. Those are the rules that we go by. Our own rules. Internal, like my internal biological clock which tells me, okay, I have to do this and this and this at a certain time. So that kind of rules over my OCD. Thanks. All right. Whether the emperor is an internal or external figure, he can be a source of great strength and resourcefulness. He is the means to carry out ideas and plans. He can be a ruthless master. So, the tyrannical parent who verbally or physically beats the self-esteem out of his children, or he can be the parent within, the overseeing, oh, the overweening superego that represses trust, spontaneity, sensuality, and creativity. So yes, there are downsides and there are, there are downsides and there are good sides. So, the Emperor may indicate a, dy a dynamic, take-charge person. Uh, one who can galvanize an apathetic group into becoming one active force. So his strength of character can lead to a rather harsh or cynical attitude toward those who do not live up to his high principles. Yeah. So, quite, quite different. Quite different. So, that is the Emperor. very, very, uh, very important stuff. So, and then, five, we have the Hierophant, which, if I can find, is a very good card. So there's the Hierophant. So, confirmation conforming to, just basically conforming to what society thinks you should be. 
So, all right, the Hierophant, a religious leader, stands in his temple, his followers at his side. His crown is faced with the sun. One horn of the crescent moon is visible. So, in his right hand, he holds a card that is pierced by the light ray of his vision. In his left hand is another card, and it is from the Cosmic Tarot, but only the book, oh, only the back can be seen. A dove flying among the pillars of the church is symbolic of the spirit. The light that bends around the hierophant is generated by an on, the Egyptian symbol of life. Two green banners, the edge of the image, symbolize the presence of nature. Even in the most refined temples, cosmos is visible through the openings of the stones. So, now, the hierophant within mm -hmm. the cosmos. Some people see in the starry sky, night sky, constellations. Some see a chaos of lights. A scientist takes fossils as proof of evolution of, on Earth. A fundamentalist Christian may consider those same fossils to be the snares put down by the devil in order to delude humankind into discounting the Genesis account of creation. So each believer considers his or her own belief system to be absolute truth. Who doesn't do that? So, the Hierophant is a paradox of differing points of views, uh, patterns, pattern or chaos, divine law or random circumstances, evolution or creation. He does not cause anything to happen. He is not creative. Uh, one could say he is a firm figment of the mind, uh, the cosmos as we see it. As ordinary mortals, we are too conditioned to understand the true nature of things, and we cannot create anything new. We can only speculate and reform the materials that we have in our realm already. So, all right, that summed up the cosmos. So, um, within the human community, the emperor, this is what he would represent in your society, basically. So, the male followers of the Hierophant are dressed in church clothes, uh, one in an outfit that resembles a cardinal's gown and cap, except that it is blue, and the other in black gown, in a black gown, and a white collar. They represent the conventional side of religion, dogma, ethics, hierarchy, scripture, as well as the speculation, speculations of theology and cosmology. So, we can kind of see there that, you know, sometimes we do need those uh, rules. So the women are more unorthodox. Their gold hoop earrings give them a gypsy flavor. The white head covering, worn by the foremost women, recalls the veils worn in church by Roman Catholic women up into the 60s. <laughs> so, but now abandoned by most women, Western women, the starry headdress decorated with a feather worn by the other woman, hints at the imagination's flight in the cosmos. So, the women are the uncon... Didn't I already read that? The women are the unconventional side of religion, visions, practices abandoned or banned by religious authorities, creation of per personal rituals, intense and single-minded devotion, the blending of indigenous and colonial religions. So, we have a lot in that card. A lot. So, um, established religion has its place. Not everyone can be a mystic, a hermit, or a leader. Some degree of stability is beneficial for most. So, and many appreciate the guidance of traditional tradition and dogma. So, religious religions such as uh, Roman Catholicism and the Tibetan Buddhism uh, values lineages of sages such as the Pope and the Dalai Lama. So. Uh, who confer on their followers knowledge and sacramental practices. The Hierophant, as a church, ideally protects solitary travel travelers. 
as well as guiding those who wish to follow a more populated road. He can provide the ground for spiritual practice, as well as a guide to ethical behavior. In that respect, the Hierophant symbolizes the prevalent morality of a social group. So, we need those, you know, we need stability and form sometimes. So, the Hierophant can also drop the seeds for neurotic guilt, intolerance, and an unhealthy suppression of natural appetites and instincts. Faith can be mindless conformity, or it can be an experience that bypasses intellectualization and selfish calculation to come truly from the heart. Church buildings, meditation centers, mosques, temples, the physical structures of religion are indicated by the Hierophant. So everything that we physically see that surrounds religion is that of the Hierophant, that is in his domain. So. Now, the Hierophant as the individual pertaining to us. The Hierophant is a priest, preacher, teacher, friend, or a group of kindred spirits who connects with us in prayer and meditation. So, Ouija Pop. Ouija Pop. So, uh, the Emperor, yes, the Hierophant, would represent the ordered structure of Ouija Pop. So, or in, uh, philosophical or ethical quests. So, he is likely to be a member of a conventional religion or faculty at an ap academic institution. He uses, his use of ritual is always elegant and effective, even if the ritual consists only in taking a certain posture to pray. So, such as kneeling or sitting cross-legged, one of the Hierophant's more extraordinary qualities is the ability to communicate directly with individuals, even while teaching a group, a large group. Makes sense? Makes a lot of sense. So possibly the Hierophant is an opportunist who uses his status to draw material and sexual favors from his students. Wow. <laughs> well, that just summed up a lot of what's going on right now with the Catholic Church. So he may relish the power to save or damn those who fall under his spell, or the spell of the doctrine he preaches. So, a true spiritual teacher, male or female, is a friend as a friend. He accepts us, who we are, not as robot-like, brainwashed uh, cultists. An authentic teacher discourages blind faith and dumb compliance. Trust is not a demand, but rather a natural, growing part of the relationship. Once a metaphysical bond is established between teacher and student, it is never broken. The teacher will never give up on the student, and the student will never lose the teacher, even in death. We can see the Hierophant as one who leads us on the path to spiritual realization, or as the path itself. So, and that's pretty cool. So that would also represent the bond or the magical chain. So we went over quite a bit today. We've gone over, yes, the Empress. Uh, the Emperor and the Hierophant. So three very important cards within the tarot. Very important cards from the tarot. And then we will finish this off. Uh, later. Later in the week. So really while I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm reading this to you guys, um, I'm learning with you. So it's, it's mutual. So everything is just a constant uh, cyclical exchange of uh, knowledge, energy, so on and so forth. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. Um, and then I kind of, I think tomorrow for Sundays with Satan, I will go more into, uh, we'll do a little more with the tarot, with just the major arcana, and then we will do uh, just a little bit more of 
the pentagram. Because the pentagram is the key to everything. And we will create our own personal pentagrams. So, it has our signature. It'll be amazing. It will be amazing. So, Ouija Boot Campers, keep doing what you're doing. Um, I, I know you guys are busy, um, so it's, it's okay. It's perfectly fine. We have a lot of time. So, um, until the next Ouija Boot Camp, so. But that won't be for a while, so we have, yes, we've been going for a while, which is cool. Very cool. So, um, alright guys, uh, I think that's it for today, so, um, I will see you all tomorrow. Oh wow, an hour and 15 minutes of me just babbling. Alright, so I'm gonna shut up. I love you all very much. With all my heart, all the way from Venus, all the way back down. And, I will see you all tomorrow, and just remember to just think think about all this and take it into consideration along your magical path and see where you end up. It's pretty cool. So, Alright guys, I love you all and thank you guys for watching and I will see you tomorrow.